Well, Father, we come to you this morning with grateful hearts. We pray, Father, that our time of singing this morning was an aroma of praise to you, Father, that was pleasing in your sight. For, Father, you deserve our praise and glory and honor and thanksgiving. Father, we come to you each week, Father, not because we have nothing better to do, but because we long to be with you. We long to worship you and to sing to you and to receive from you. We long to experience more of God. We long to gather together as the saints to encourage one another, to build one another up, to to love on one another, to serve each other, to carry one another's burdens. We long to be encouraged by each other, to receive from one another. And so, Father, this morning, we ask for you to do that again. We ask you to meet with us. We ask you to speak to us clearly through your word, Father. Reveal your glory to us, God. Meet with us. Spirit of God, I pray now that you would have your way among us, that you would fill us with your spirit. Help us to see wonderful things from your word, God, because that is what is in your word, is wonderful things. We need you, though, Father. We need you, Spirit of God, to open our eyes to see it. As John prayed this morning from Psalm 127, unless the the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. And so, Father, this morning, send your spirit, build this house, work in our hearts, draw near to us, reveal to us the glory of our Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. All right, please join me as we read from Ephesians chapter 3. Verses 14 through 19. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. What is your experience of the presence of God of the love of Christ, of the power of the Holy Spirit. What is your experience? Martin Lloyd-Jones, one of my favorite preachers from the 20th century, once said that what we believe and experience of the truth of God is revealed in our prayers and in our praying. John mentioned earlier this morning uh, that um, one of the habits that he has in his life and that we would encourage in the church that is not unique to us or original to us is praying through the scriptures. So he referenced Psalm 127. There are many prayers in the scripture that we can model. Many of the Psalms are prayers that we want to model in our life and and we can simply pray through literally taking one line and asking God to apply it to our lives. And here this morning, we come to a section of Ephesians that is a prayer. My Bible calls it a prayer for spiritual strength. And what, what's happening here is Paul has spent three chapters now teaching doctrine, has, has had no imperatives for us, to, for us to do necessarily. It's been primarily indicatives. It's been primarily this is who God is. This is what God has done for us. And, and now, before he moves on, we're about to transition into the second half of this book, and we want to talk about life in the church, life in the body of Christ, life as believers. There's going to be more imperatives. For those of you who like imperatives, who like do's, do this, don't do that, we're going to have a lot of that for the next few months. But before we move there, before Paul gets into that, he wants to stop here and recognize what we've just received all these indicatives. This is who God is. This is what God has done. And before we move on into all this, remember last week he said, do not lose heart. Well, he's aware that we are so prone to lose heart. We're, he's aware that we need help from God to apply these truths, to walk in this new way of life. 
And so he stops here and prays this magnificent prayer. He prays this magnificent prayer there. You would be hard-pressed to find a richer prayer. You'd be hard-pressed to find a more Trinitarian prayer. There is, he's appealing to God the Father for the strength of the Spirit and for the love of Christ to be known. It's a glorious prayer, one that you would be hard-pressed to find a better prayer to model your own prayers after, to pray through. And so we would encourage you to do that. Ultimately, there is no better way to determine one's spiritual health and condition than by one's prayers. If a man's prayers are formal, so is his spiritual life. And so this morning, as you see Paul praying for the Ephesians, I want you to ask yourself, does this describe my life as a Christian? Are my prayers like this? Do I regularly experience the power of God? empowering my life as a believer? Is Christ dwelling in my heart by faith? Do I know the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and the love of Christ? Have I been staggered as I consider it? Am I affected by these truths? Or do I read them and and just move on, just check it off my list and move on unaffected about my day? Do I know what it is to be filled with all the fullness of God? Have I reached that that level, that height? Am I living there? Is that where I dwell? We want to be careful here because there's there's always a danger that we we can listen to these things, we can read these things, we can read this doctrine, and we can shake our heads and say, yes, I know that. We can tell others, this is this is who God is, and this is what He's done, and this is what you should do, and we can remain unaffected. We need the Spirit of God to work in our hearts, to animate life, to to move our affections, to love Him more, to find nourishment for our souls. And so this morning, that's what we want to do. We want to pray for God to help us to experience more of Him. And who who in here would raise His hand and say, no, I've got enough. I've experienced as much of God as I want. That's what this prayer is about. If I had to summarize Paul's prayer for the Ephesians this morning, and by extension for you and me, I would say Paul is praying here for us to be empowered by the Spirit of God, to know and reflect the love of God in Christ. So we want to pray that this morning. Well, let's look at the text First, we want to start off and look at how, God, how Paul approaches God the Father in prayer. So he starts off for this reason. So last, two weeks ago, we remember uh, Bart prayed and served us so well in praying from uh, the first several verses of chapter 3, and he, and he starts off the same way. Paul says, for this reason. He says, for this reason, I, Paul, and then he, and he stops and he, he interrupts himself, and he, and he kind of goes off in this rabbit trail as, as he is prone to do and exulting in the Lord. Well, here he says, for this reason, and so he's calling to mind, he's, he's resuming what he started to do in the beginning of chapter 3. For this reason calls us back to everything that he's written thus far. So if you review everything in, in Ephesians chapters 1 and chapters 2 and chapter 3, Paul has spent three chapters extolling the the reconciling work of Christ. He has been talking about who we were and who we are. He's talking about his own calling and as an apostle. These are the convictions which undergird his prayer. These are the convictions that are the foundation of his prayers. He approaches God the Father. He knows things about God the Father. He's not approaching him as some distant deity or some unknown God. He knows God. He knows his purpose and the work the reconciling, redemptive work of his son, Jesus Christ. And as a result of those things, then he goes to the Father. Informed by the doctrine, he goes to prayer. And he recognizes that if we are going to walk in a manner worthy of God, all these things that he's going to call us to, putting off the old self, putting on the new self, walking in a manner worthy of the Lord, we need help. We need spiritual strength. And so he goes to God the Father and asks that. He says he bows his knees before the Father. He says, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. 
So he's not praying to some unknown God. When he prays, he's praying to the heavenly father, his heavenly father. There's a relationship there. He's known. He goes to him like a father who loves him, who is leaning forward to his children, who says, yes, son, what can I do for you today? Yes, son, tell me, what is it that I can do for you to help you? Paul prays to the father knowing that as Jesus said, our heavenly father knows how to give good gifts to his children. He longs to do just that. And more than that, more than his desire, he has the ability to bless his children. He says that I pray to the heavenly father according to the riches of his glory, according to the riches of his glory. So he is able to do far more abundantly than all that we can ask or think. His giving is consistent with his storehouses. He gives to his children according to the riches of his glory. And who can measure the riches of his glory? They're limitless, inexhaustible, immeasurable. There is no limit to God's ability to bless his children. When my kids ask for me for a gift, when my kids come and say, Daddy, can I get this? Can we go and do that? I have to log into my account, to my checking account, and I have to see, do I have the ability to bless my kids? Because I want to. I want to go and do all these things, especially when they, when they say, I want to go to the Dallas Cowboys game, Daddy. Yes, I want to. And then I look online, and I say, nope, we can't do that. That is more than my ability to bless But God doesn't do that. He never has to do that. Where my ability to bless is limited, God's is limitless. He is unrestrained in his ability to bless. So he has the desire to bless because he's a loving father. He has the ability to bless because his riches of his glory are limitless, inexhaustible. To doubt the provision that God has made for us is to doubt the provision that God has made, has secured in his son. God's supply to bless is as extensive as the benefits secured by Jesus on the cross. So when we pray, we can pray with confidence, with joyful anticipation, not with doubting, because God desires to bless us and he has the ability to bless us. So informed by those foundations, by those convictions, what does Paul ask for? What does he pray for the Ephesians. So let's look at the content of his prayer. The first thing that he prays for is power. He prays for us to be strengthened, to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Paul prays for strength because he knows our weakness. He knows our inability. The obvious implication when he prays for something is that there's a lack. So if he's praying for strength, it's because he discerns lack, weakness, inability on our behalf. And this isn't something unique to us. It's, it's prone to the human condition. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the Lord, the God I love. So Paul is praying because instead of weak, joyless Christians marked by failure and frustration and inadequacy, Paul wants to see vigorous men and women, believers, brothers and sisters, walking in community, joyful, unflappable because of their inner strength, because of their inner strength derived by the power, by the work, by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Paul, make no mistake here, he is, he's, not, he's praying for a very specific type of strength. We've seen prayers for strength throughout Scripture. We see Gideon praying for physical strength. We see David praying for strength to conquer. He's not praying for physical strength. He's not praying for political strength here. He is praying for spiritual strength, for inner strength in the inner being. Bible scholar P.T. O'Brien wrote a wonderful commentary on this book. And he says this of the inner being. He says, the inner being is the focal point at the center of a person's life where the spirit does his strengthening and renewing work. Indeed, the inner self stands in need of empowering given our struggle against, against sin. Let me say that again. The inner self stands in need of empowering given our struggle against sin and our need for daily renewal. When the outer person of the believer is wasting away, says 2 Corinthians 4.16, the inner person is being renewed day by day from strength to strength. Isn't that true? 
Last week, you remember John, uh, John preached a wonderful sermon on, on these previous few verses, and he referenced a, a, a man named Richard Wormbrand, you remember this, uh, who wrote a book called Tortured for Christ. And in that book, he details uh, the persecution that he endured and the opportunities it, it presented him to preach the gospel to those who would surely not have heard otherwise. Wormbrand was able to live his life being persecuted, suffered, tortured, testifying to the grace of God in the midst of being constantly persecuted, like the Apostle Paul, only because of the empowering presence and work of the Holy Spirit in his life. Wormbrand would have faltered early on in his sufferings apart from that. And that's how, and that's the same for you and me in the sufferings that we do know. D.A. Carson writes this. He says, most of us in the West have not suffered great persecution, but all of us are getting older. In fact, sometimes we can see in elderly folk something of the process that Paul has in mind. We all know senior saints who, as their physical strength is reduced, nevertheless become more and more steadfast and radiant. Their memories may be failing. Their arthritis may be nearly unbearable. Their ventures beyond their small rooms or apartments may be severely curtailed, but somehow, somehow they live as if they already have one foot in heaven. As their outer being weakens, their inner being runs from strength to strength. Oh, that God might grant us to live like that with one foot raised, one foot in heaven, our joy out of the reach of our enemies, that our circumstances, that, that all those things that, that, that assail us day to day when we wake up and, and find those bills are still there to be paid, that we still need to find a job, that that relationship still needs mended, that that sin still needs to be overcome, that our joy would be secured in who we are in Christ Jesus, that our, our security, that our identity would be sure in the love of God in Christ Jesus. I thank God for the many examples we have in this church, saints, senior or not, that walk in this manner, filled with the power of God, walking in the joy of the Lord, always seeking to encourage. You see them, and you wonder sometimes if they're putting you on when you say, how are you doing? And they tell you good, and you're like, really? Because it, it looks like you might have something to complain about, and, and, and yet they don't. They, they say, no, God has been good to me. God is my strength. The joy of the Lord is carrying me along. We meet these folks and we're encouraged and may your tribe increase. So this is the kind of strength we should have in mind, not physical strength, but strength in our inner being. Paul is asking God to strengthen the Ephesians in their hearts, in their inner being, that they would be built up, fortified, braced, invigorated, that they would know the strength of the Spirit's inner reinforcement and may lay hold ever more of the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. Paul knows that the life of the believer is, is assailed with all kinds of trials and sufferings. And to endure the Christian life with power and faithfulness in a way that reflects God's own character, that is what he's praying for. Proverbs 4.23 is a, maybe a very familiar verse that says, keep your heart with all vigilance for out of it flow the springs of life. Another way to say that is, is, is you, if you put the center right, the rest of it will look after itself. It's not the temptations, listen, it's not the temptations and the circumstances that face us that determine our conduct. It's the heart of the man who faces them. Two men may face the same circumstances. One falls and the other stands. Why? Because of the inner strength of the Lord, because of the way that God has built the man, because of the way that he attends him, because of the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. When our inner man has been strengthened by the Holy Spirit, what happens around us is relatively unimportant. What happens to us is relatively unimportant. And we can stand there and say with Ezra in the book of Nehemiah, the joy of the Lord is our strength. 
our confidence, our security, our identity is hidden in Christ on high. Paul's primary concern is to pray for a display of God's power in the domains of our inner being that controls our character and prepares us for heaven. That is his prayer. Not for a change of circumstances. Notice what he doesn't pray. He's not praying for a change of their circumstances. He's not praying, God, protect them from persecution. God, deliver them from prison. God, heal them. Surely he prayed those things. Those are good things to pray. It's good to pray for health. It's good to pray for deliverance. But that's not his primary concern here. So Paul is praying for us to be strengthened by the Spirit in our inner being. Why? Notice this this next word here. So that... So that, so that is a, it, it, it says because, because of this, this is why I'm praying for strength, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts. Now, if you have, uh, if you've been a Christian for some time, if you've read your Bible, if you know some doctrine, you would, you might be raising your hand saying, okay, now hang on, Christ dwells in my heart as a Christian. Every believer has the spirit of Christ in him, Right? Doesn't Christ make his home our hearts? Isn't that what we just read in Ephesians chapter 2? It is. He does dwell in our hearts, but it's a progressive thing. It's a, it's a thing, the dwelling of Christ, the indwelling of Christ is a thing of degrees, right? There's progressive movement there. This is where, this is where it's helpful to know a little bit about the language behind this text. I've told you before, I don't, I barely know English, so I don't know Greek, but there are Bible scholars I lean on that help. And so this word dwell, there are two words in the Greek language that are translated this way, parakeo and katoikeo. Okay, they sound very similar, and they mean very similar things, but they, are, they do mean different things. They are similar but different. So the first word is a weak verb. The second word is a strong verb. The first one means to inhabit a place as a stranger which is, in fact, the word that, God, that Paul uses in chapter 2, verse 19, when he says that you are no longer strangers and aliens. That's that word. That's that first word. So it, it talks about an, a stranger and alien who is in a place, but that's not his home. That's not where he dwells. That's not where he stays. That's not his permanent residence. The second word means something more than that. It means, it means to settle down. It means to settle down somewhere, make it your home, to take up residence to make this your home, not a temporary stay, but a permanent dwelling, not a stay in a hotel one night and go on the next, but this is where I'm building for the future. Many of you know that um, a few months ago, my uh, Holly and I uh, sold our house up in Dallas. We still had a house up in Dallas. We just, we hadn't sold yet. And so we sold it a few months ago, bought a house here in Round Rock, uh, just a few miles down the road from where we've been renting for the last three years. And, um, it's a fixer upper. Many of you uh, have been there. You've seen it. Many of you helped me helped us move in, and I thank you a thousand times. I thank you. Um, and so you've seen it needs work. When we first bought it, it needed more work. We 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 walked into this house, and someone uh, there's a couple that had made this their home for years. The house was built in 1978. It still had the wallpaper from 1978, so it had floral, colorful floral wallpaper in one room. It had, in the kitchen, you'd walk in, you'd see orange teapots on the wall, wallpaper, not real wall, teapots. Uh, there was green, like a lime green tile when you walk into the house. That's what welcomed you, is this lime green tile. You're not sure if it was designed green or if it just became green over time. There were uh, plumbing leaks and electrical problems. There was a leak in the roof, so rain was coming in. I would hear it dripping in the attic. There was, um, there, there was, a, <laughs> there was a particular odor to the house, one that might be, it might be offensive to try and describe it, so I'm just going to move on from that. There were piles of trash in the attic. When we, when we moved in, I had to call the other realtor because I said, hey, there, there's a lot of stuff in the attic. It, there's two, actually two separate attics in the house, and there were just mounds of boxes and bags that, that needed to be cleaned out. So over the last six or seven weeks, we have, we've rolled up our sleeves and we've gotten to work. I hired, we hired a crew to come in and to pull down the wallpaper. We had glitter popcorn on the ceilings, not just popcorn, but gold flakes all over the ceiling. It was kind of like a disco room. You know, you'd walk in, it's like, yeah, this is, this is festive. Um, 
So we, we scraped all that, we pulled the wallpaper, we have fixed the plumbing leaks, we have, uh, with the help of, of some of you, we've fixed the electrical problems that were in the house, uh, we have replaced trim work. In the years to come, we're hoping to add next room, we're hoping to remodel the kitchen at some point. Uh, what we're doing is we are we're seeking to make this house our own. Okay, this isn't a house that we're uh, staying in for a short time. By God's grace, we pray that we will be here for the rest of our lives with you. And so we want this house to be our home. We want it to reflect who we are. It reflected well the people who lived there before. God bless them with their taste. <laughs> what we're doing now is we're trying to make it suit us. We're trying to make it so that we come in and we feel comfortable and we look around and we say, this is, this is our home. Listen, when Christ comes into our hearts, what he does is he sets about making it his home. There are leaks in the roof. There, are, there is carpet that has to be pulled up. There are walls that have to be taken down. There are many problems that he has to overcome. There, there is painting to be done. There is work to be done. And he sets about that work, making our hearts his own. He is taking up residence within us. And it takes time. And it's a progressive work. It doesn't happen all at once. But it takes time. And that is what he does to make our hearts his own so that we would progressively reflect his character and his person all the more. That is what he's doing. Again, D.A. Carson says, this first petition then is a plea for power, power to be holy, power to think, act, and talk in ways utterly pleasing to Christ, power to strengthen moral resolve, power to walk in transparent gratitude to God. Power to be humble, power to be discerning, power to be obedient and trusting, power to grow in conformity to Jesus Christ. Here, here is no merely creedal Christianity. Biblical Christianity, of course, insists that certain truths be believed, but it is not merely creedal. Listen, the devil himself can recite the Apostles' Creed and doubtless confesses its truth. Yet, he has not, he has personally experienced nothing of its transforming power. But God's purpose of the men and women he redeems is not simply to have them believe certain truths, but to transform them in a lifelong process that stretches toward heaven. So Paul, so Paul is praying along just such lines. Paul is praying, aware of our weakness, aware of our frailty, aware that we are prone to wander. He prays for resolve. He prays for the empowering work of the Holy Spirit to come into our lives, to strengthen us, to know and reflect the love of God in Christ. This brings us to the second petition of Paul. What does he pray? He says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that, there's that word again, that, because for this reason, for the purpose of that, you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Paul is praying for knowledge. Paul is praying for experience like the first petition, this is a prayer for power, not of, not of strength of physicality, but of strength of knowledge. This one works differently. It enables us to grasp the limitless dimensions of the love of God in Christ. Now, Paul is not saying that they have no knowledge of the love of Christ. He knows that they have some knowledge of it. They have to have some knowledge of it because that is what the Holy Spirit testifies to when he brings us to salvation, when he converts us, when he changes our hearts, when he indwells us, he opens our eyes to see the glory of Christ. But not all of it. Maybe you've been to the Grand Canyon and you've seen some of the Grand Canyon, but you could spend weeks there and not see all of it, not see all the glory there is to appreciate. And that's how it is with the love of Christ. Of course, they have some grasp of it, but Paul is clearly assuming that their appreciation for the significance, their grasp of it, 
their functional knowledge of it, okay? Their functional knowledge of what is central to the gospel is lacking. And the result is instability in the church, instability in their lives, confusion for them regarding their identity and their purpose in life. Instead, Paul wants to see Christians living in community with one another who know well the love of God in Christ. He wants to see them experience the all-encompassing love of Christ and, and therefore knowing in their hearts, knowing with everything that that's, their identity is never in question because of who they are in Christ Jesus, secured by the reconciling, redeeming work of Christ on the cross. He wants this to be their reality. Now, this is not, this is not a prayer that they might love Christ more. It's a good thing to pray. Again, good thing to pray, but that's not what this is. This isn't Paul saying, you should love God more. It's good to pray that. No, no. What he is praying is that we might have a better grasp of his love for us. We are moved more by his love for us than by simple calls to love God more. And this cannot be a mental exercise alone. He's not merely hoping that we can clearly define and explain the love of Christ to others. He wants us to experience this love functionally in our being, in our inner being, that that would just be our reality. It's one thing for me to tell my wife and my kids that I love them. I can look at them and say, I I love you. It's another thing altogether for them to testify, my dad loves me, and here's how I know, and here's what I see day to day. I know that he loves me. When he's in the room, he's giving me attention. He's not focused on his phone, Lord help me. He's not always distant. He's not physically removed all the time, doing other things than spending time with me. My father loves me because when he's with me, he gives me his attention. He shows me his affection. He teaches me good things. He gives me good gifts. Paul wants us to know God that way. Not that we can simply say, well, I, I, know, I, I know that God loves me. I mean, everybody knows that God loves me. It's something else to say of my experience. I experienced the love of God in Christ displayed once for all on the cross, but applied daily, constantly by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit in my life. Don't you want that? Don't you want more of that, more power, more strength, more of the presence of God, more of the functional power of God in your life, testifying to the, to the love of God in Christ for you? Not for somebody out there, not some general, at the real, you know, love that's, that's just out there that we just kind of speak of, but a love that we feel and experience and can testify to. This is what Paul is praying. He wants us to experience more of God, to know the limitless dimensions of the love of God in Christ. One of my heroes is a man named Adnaram Judson. Uh, in fact, we... Uh, my wife and I respect Adnaram Judson so much. He was a Baptist missionary to Burma who, uh, who lived a life testifying to the love of God in Christ, uh, translating the Bible into Burmese. In fact, the, the Burmese translate, he lived like almost 200 years ago, I think. Someone can fact check me on that later or receive your email. And um, he lived almost 200 years ago, and the translation that he made 200 years ago is still the one that they use today. If you go to Burma, they still uh, they, they have churches that are Judson Baptist Church or Judson Church of God or whatever it is named in his honor because of the work that he did. But he suffered incessantly, and he he lost his his wife died when he was on his first trip over there, and then his child died. He married again; she died. Their children, some of them, died. He marries a third time. She outlived him, but their, some of their children died prematurely. He knew suffering, but he pressed on because of the inner strength, because of the power of the Spirit working in his life. And more than that, he didn't do this with, a, with some kind of stalwart heart. But as I read biographies of Judson, as I read of this man, he was a man who was affected by the love of God in Christ. He was a man who was regularly moved to tears. He would weep reading his scripture. As he translated the scriptures, he would do it with tears flowing from his eyes, aware and considering what this love of God in Christ was for him personally, as well as for those he was ministering to. When was the last time that you wept? 
When was the last time that you wept because of God's love for you? Are you regularly affected by God's love? Is this something that you just, you just pass or you say, yes, I know that God loves me. And I'm on to bigger and better things. Give me the imperatives. I sympathize. But Paul prays that we would not rush past this, that we would dwell here, that we would be able to know and to reflect the love of God in Christ in our daily experience, that that's what others would experience of us as well. I want to suggest that a genuine and deep appreciation for the love of God in Christ only rarely and exceptionally comes to the man who is not spending time in his word, who is not spending time praying and asking God. What is it that James says you, you do not have because you do not ask? We want to spend time considering God's love for us, and we want to ask and pray, God, work this in my heart. Help me to see more of this, the limitless dimensions of the love of God in Christ. Help me to know this so that my affections might be moved truly and not superficially. We don't want to live superficial lives as Christians, like, like the jet ski that just kind of skims along the surface, trying to cover as much ground as we can. We want to be like the scuba divers who go down deep. You think of Psalm 1, who talks about the man who is rooted like a tree planted by streams of water, yielding its fruit in its season. Paul prays that we would be rooted and grounded in this love he says, rooted and grounded, a term agricultural and a term architectural. Both of them symbolize that our foundation should be in the love of God. That's where our foundation is, is in the love of God. He compares us to a well-rooted tree and a well-framed house. In both cases, the unseen cause of their stability, the unseen, it's the unseen cause of their stability. You look at a tree, its strength is not in the leaves. That's the fruit of its strength. Its strength is in the roots that go down into the ground. The strength of a house that protects it when the winds come and the storms rage, the strength of that house is in the foundation. If the, if the foundation is sure, that house will stand. Sinclair Ferguson says, love, the love of God in Christ is the soil in which Christians live. It is also the foundation by which they will be shaped as their life of faith is built. Paul prays that we would know the love of God in Christ that surpasses understanding. Christ's love is as unknowable as his riches are unsearchable. Paul prays that we would know the unknowable. That's, that's a fun prayer. Help me to know what I can't know. That they might come to grasp it in a way that would control their lives and shape who they are. P.T. O'Brien says of this passage, to speak of Christ's love as surpassing knowledge means that it is so great that one can never know it fully. We can never plumb its depths or comprehend its magnitude. No matter how much we know of the love of Christ, how fully we enter into his love for us, there is always more to experience. And the implication in the light of the following words is that we cannot be as spiritually mature as we should be unless we are empowered by the Spirit of God to grasp the limitless dimensions of the love of Christ. Paul is praying this because when the storms of life come upon us and the trials and the, and the suffering that we do endure, our faith will come into question. It will be tested and so being rooted and grounded in love is more than simply an intellectual exercise. It's not a doctrinal test to pass upon entrance to heaven. Being rooted and established in his love go beyond emotional experience and come only from soaking in the gospel and spending time with our Savior. It comes from singing. We sing his praises this morning. That's, that is being rooted and grounded in his love is securing this. And it's testifying to one another and proclaiming to one another that God is good that God's love is for you. It is sure. It was purchased at the cross of Golgotha. And this doesn't happen overnight, but it's the result of, of what one writer calls a long obedience in the same direction. It's, it's daily plodding along and spending time in his words, cultivating a heart of affection for God, 
for his love in Christ Jesus for you. It's over time that God shapes us after his image. Like the growing of a tree, it's, it's receiving its nutrients from the roots of that tree over months and years. And it's only then that it will be, be able to withstand the storms. Many of us, you know, when you, we built a house several years ago, the one we just sold, uh, we built it brand new and we had this, this little tree that we planted out front. And for the first few years of that tree, uh, you know what I'm talking about? We had, the, we had these cables that were planted in the ground that helped the tree stabilize. Because apart from those cables, storms would come through and they would just blow it over. And we'd come out of the ground, and we'd have to replant it and hope and pray that the roots would take root and, and grow. Well, that's, that's what happens with the Christian life is that um, over time, that tree gets bigger. On my, on my street where we just built, uh, we had a man drive through the other day and he stopped out front of my neighbor's house and he was looking at this great oak tree. It's a 40-year-old oak tree. And this man was admiring it. And my neighbor, Todd, came outside and was asking this guy, why are you, why are you staring at my tree, man? And uh, the guy said, I planted this tree 40 years ago. And I, it was small. When I left, we, we were only in the house for a few years and I moved on. And now it's this magnificent, I mean, it is, it is, you should come to my house and appreciate this tree. It is an amazing tree. My tree is not amazing. It's an Arizona ash tree that it may not survive another year, but this oak tree is glorious. It has taken root, and it is producing fruit into its 40th year now. And that's how God works in our lives. And notice this is not a call to private faith merely. He says that he prays that we would comprehend this. What does that say? With all the saints with all the saints. This is a call. There, there is the, the concept of a, of a Lone Ranger Christian, of a solo believer, of someone who says, well, I, I have my faith at home and I, I read my Bible and you can just leave me alone with all that church relational nonsense. That's a, that's a concept foreign to the Bible. The Bible does not speak of Lone Ranger Christians, of, of men who, who are strong in the faith and who exist on their own, who don't receive from others. No, we are called to community. We're called as members of one another. Remember that? We've, we've heard about that already here in Ephesians. We are members one of another, built up together into the household of God. The hand cannot say to the foot, I have no need of you. Remember that? That's, that's what we're called to. We are not isolated individuals, but fellow citizens together of another world, brothers and sisters. We are called to love one another, to serve one another, to carry one another's burdens. We are called to encourage one another, to instruct one another. God has created us as dependent creatures one on another. We need each other in order to grasp the limitless dimensions of Christ's love as he makes it visible in and through each other's lives. So as I, as I, as I meet with others in this church, as I meet uh, you know, with, with Bart or with Juan or with Chase or with Mike, I hear about the work of God in their lives, and I'm encouraged, I'm built up, I'm challenged. As I share my struggles, as I share my burdens, they come alongside and encourage me. They help me. They point to the love of God in Christ and say, there, put your attention there. That's what changes us. John Stott wrote a wonderful little book on Ephesians, and he says, we shall have power to comprehend these dimensions of Christ's love only with all the saints, only with all the saints, the isolated Christian. He can indeed know something of the love of Jesus, but his grasp of it is bound to be limited by his limited experience. It needs the whole people of God to understand the whole love of God. All the saints together, Jews and Gentiles, men and women, young and old, black and white, with all their varied backgrounds and experiences. You can know something of the love of God in Christ as a solo Lone Ranger Christian, but it is a limited experience. It is a weak experience. It is a tree that tries to grow up on its own without the support of those cables it is a tree that grows without the nutrients of all the roots that are intended for it. It's a severed, it's severed from, from its roots and from its nutrients. To grow in the love of Christ makes the life of the Christian richer in every way. 
What was once drudgery becomes delight. While spending time with other Christians was once, was once a burden, now we, we long and we treasure times of fellowship. We love to meet with one another and hear answers to one another's prayers. I love to gather together with my small group when we meet as men and to hear how God is meeting us. To hear reports from my wife when she goes to a ladies' meeting, she comes back weeping because of how God moved in their meeting, in their experience, how she's encouraged because somebody shared a burden or somebody shared a sin and, and somebody else said, me too. Can you pray for that for me too? This is how God works in our lives. We grow to love one another as we do life together with the same love that God and Christ loves us. Finally, Paul prays all of this. If you look at the end of verse 19, it says he prays all of this, that, there's that word again, that because for the purpose of, for the reason, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. This is it. This is the climax of the prayer. This is what he's been building towards. These are not separate petitions. Uh, can, you, can, you, can you do this for me? And can you also do this for me? And can you also do this for them? No, he is moving in one direction. Many commentators describe this prayer as a staircase, moving up, going towards a, de a destination. Or maybe it's like climbing a mountain. So you're not, you're not making this hold, and then you're like, oh, I think I'll go try this one over here. No, a mountain climber climbs here, and then, and then here, and then here, moving upward, trying to get there, trying to get to the pinnacle, the climax, to the point, to the crux, up there, and then, then he can stand on the mountain and say, glorious! Look out and, in, and take in the view and to enjoy it. Well, Paul is now at the climax of his prayer. You are at the top of the mountain. You can stand and behold the glorious view, the fullness of God. Experience that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. This is what he's praying for. This is the summit. What can you ask for more than the fullness of God? What else could you possibly petition our Heavenly Father? More of him, more of his presence, more of his empowering, more awareness of his love. God himself. There is no more staggering statement in all of scripture that we would be filled with the fullness of God. Now, what does this mean, the fullness of God, being filled with the fullness of God? If you, like me, have Mormons come knock at your door, they talk to you about how we can be like God. Is that what we mean here? No. Is it like the mystics who tell us that one day that we will simply dissolve and become part of the eternal being? Or is it like, is it like the pantheists who say that, um, that God is in everything and that everything is God? Or maybe the New Age people who talk about experiencing the divine. We want to experience the divine today. A thousand times, no. So what is it that Paul is praying for? What is this fullness of God? Paul is praying. Paul is praying that Christ would dwell in our hearts, that we would have an ever-growing, a progressive experience of the power and the, experience, the empowering presence of the Spirit in a way that our character begins to reflect the character of God, that our words begin to reflect the words of God, that our thoughts begin to think like God. that we experience more victory in our life, that we have confidence in our inner being of who God is for us and what he's doing through us, that our joy is truly out of the reach of our enemies. God wants us to experience his fullness, but the only way that we can do that is by the empowerment of his spirit, by the indwelling presence of his son, Jesus Christ. Now, Paul wants us to experience his fullness. That doesn't mean that we will be like him in every way. Rob and Everett have served us so well, along with the worship team, in focusing our times of worship on the uh, attributes of God over these last few months. Guys, you know, wherever you are, thank you for doing that so well. Everett, this morning, thank you for drawing us to God's omniscience. We're not going to be omniscient 
It's not the fullness of God that he's talking about. Theologians have long distinguished the attributes of God into the incommunicable and the communicable attributes of God. The incommunicable are those that God does not share with us. Those would include his omniscience. Those would include his eternity, his unchangeable, his omnipresence, his omnipotence. We are not going to be omnipotent as much as we try to be. But the communicable attributes are those that God does share with us. Those include his love and his wisdom, his mercy, his knowledge, his justice. So experiencing the fullness of God means progressively sharing and reflecting the character of God, the presence of God, the love of God in Christ, in our lives, and to one another. Do you see that in this text? Do you see how, how Paul is carefully making his argument. He has already prayed that Christ may dwell in our hearts by faith. He, he prays that because without that, being filled with the fullness of God is impossible. But when Christ actually dwells in our inner being by faith, when we begin to know the fullness of the love of God in Christ, then we begin to experience the fullness of God. Then we begin to reflect it to one another. Then as, as you encountered one another, it becomes a joy, and, and, and others start to share with you, thank you. You know, I just want you to know that, that when I'm with you, I'm encouraged. I am built up. You have others. You, you remember in, in, in Peter when he, he talks about be ready at all times to give a reason for the hope that you have within you? People start asking for that reason when they see that God, the presence of God radiating through your life. That's the effect of the fullness of God. Do you see how this is not some, some prayer that's just kind of out there that's inapplicable to our daily lives? This is an intensely practical prayer. It's not vague. It's not abstract. He didn't write this in order to stimulate our thinking primarily. He didn't write this so that we would argue about doctrine. He wrote this in order to help us in our daily life. He knows that we are prone to lose heart. He knows that as we face the imperatives that he's about to launch into this. This is what I, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. God, help me. I can't. I can't do it. I am tormented with thoughts and with desires and with, you know, just a, sometimes I'm, I'm just blah. I need help. I need the inner strengthening of the Holy Spirit. And that's what Paul is arguing for. This, friends, this is glorious. This is majestic. This is a prayer worth modeling your time of prayer after. This, take, take this prayer this week and pray. Father, according to the riches of your glory, grant me to be strengthened with power. Grant me, God, to be strengthened with power in my inner being so that Christ may dwell in my heart through faith. God, help me to be rooted, to be grounded in love, that I might have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. God, fill me with your fullness. Help me to experience more of you. Empower me by your spirit. This is a prayer that should be our heart's desire. Listen, in closing, Paul wrote this letter to Christians like you and me. These are not people who do not know God, who do not know lo the love of Christ to some extent. They know it, some. We know it, some. We experience his presence, some. And that's good, and that's to be celebrated, to be clinged to, and to sing about. But we want more. He wants more for us. This letter is written... For the Christians that even have all their doctrine right, for those who can take the theological exam and pass it with flying colors and yet say, I know nothing of, of the presence of God, the empowerment of God, I, I don't know. The love of God in Christ, that sounds kind of like for my wife, you know, for girls. Paul is here praying for people like you and me, people who have a solid grasp of gospel truth, but who need the power of the Holy Spirit to ground us in the reality of God's truth, of God, his love in Christ for us. So that when the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon us, that we might begin to experience the fullness of God. And these 
These are the foundational elements of a gospel community, of what we're building here, of a gospel culture. And when, when others come into that gospel community, when weak, when broken people come into that community, they don't simply hear the gospel preached. They hear that. Praise God, we have, you know, John serves us week after week with gospel goodness. But when they come in, they don't hear, hear it preached simply. They encounter it. They taste and see the goodness of the love of God in Christ. And they see that it's for them too. As we leave today, let's leave here praying earnestly for God to do just that. Please join me in prayer. Father in heaven, we, we thank you. you. You are magnificent, God. As we read, as we've heard from Ephesians 1 and 2 and 3 now, God, of all that you've done, as you have taken us who were strangers and aliens, you have reconciled us to you through the blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. God, we praise you. We thank you, Father, that by grace we have been saved. We thank you, God, that you have put your spirit within us. We thank you for calling us in the community. We thank you for the community you've given us, God. I pray that you would help us to see your love for us in Christ Jesus, that you would empower us by the Holy Spirit, that you would strengthen us in our inner being. Dwell within us, God. Make our hearts your home. Help us to know, to see, to love, to experience the love of God in Christ and to therefore be filled with all the fullness of God. Help this to make a difference in our daily lives. Help us to wake up tomorrow, to go home today, to have hope for the week, to have fresh faith for that relationship, God, that is so strained. We wonder if it's broken. We wonder if it will ever be mended. God, help us to have faith for one another as we look at others and we see the sin that they struggle with, God, help us to speak words of faith to them of the love of God in Christ for them, of the power that is available to us according to the riches of your glory. We praise your holy name and pray all of this because of the work of our Savior, Jesus Christ.